This works too. Here's my question for today. We have a principle formulated by the Gemara at the end of Masech Yoma. It's a very fundamental principle and it has to do with matters of life and death. And that is called V'chai Bahem. The Torah says you should live by them. V'loshi Yomus Bahem. Which means that if there's a an head-on collision between life and the violation of a Torah law, then we violate the Torah for the sake of saving a life. That's called the Chai are you, are you familiar with that? Okay, now you wanted me to introduce myself, so I'll just say a few words here. I'm working in an institution that's not far from here, which is called the Amic Learning Center. You're all invited to come and visit us. It's on Rehov Amik Rifaim, right on the way to Talpiot, number 64. And it's a pleasure here again. I'm trying to fill in great shoes here, but the rabbi asked me to fill in. So the Chaiban. There are exceptions to this rule. Anybody know which? Okay, let's go through the three cases. Number one, Hilarias, Pichas Tamim, and Avodah Zarah. So in the case of Avodah Zarah, if somebody puts a gun to your head and says violate Avodah Zarah and worship an idol, or I'll kill you, you have to allow yourself to die rather than to violate Avodah Zarah and worship the idol. And the reason for that is because the Torah says, we say it in Kriya Shema twice a day, Bechol Nafshecha. And the Gemara interprets that to mean, Afilu who no tell is Nafshecha. Even if he takes your life, your love for God supersedes. And then the Gemara asks, how do we know Gili Arayos? That there too, if he puts a gun to your head, you're not going to violate Gili Arayos for the sake of saving your life. And the Gemara derives murder from that case, Ritzicha, Shvi But as far as the entire Torah, that's 610, the principle is V'chai Bahem. Those are exceptions to the rule, rather than the rule. The Torah is basically saying that life takes precedence over the Torah law. Again, given that there are three exceptions to that rule. And from that perspective, we violate the Shabbos for the sake of pikuach nefesh. If the physician tells us that we need the following treatment, because otherwise the patient will die, or even might die, then we will violate the Shabbos. And whatever the physician tells us, he's the expert, we're relying on him. But Chaimahem applies He's not going to give up his life for the sake of Shabbos. And the first source on your page is the Rambam in Hilcha Shabbos, Perik Bey's Halacha Aleph. And the Rambam says, Duchuya hi Shabbos, Eitzel Sakonis Nefashos, Hishar Kol Mitzvos. And Duchuya means we override the Shabbos for the sake of pikuach nefesh, sakonas nefachos, like any other mitzvah. Now, before we get to analyze this Rambam, which I want to do today, based on the methodology, the teaching of my Rebbe, Rav Salvatius, I want to raise the following question. I want to present to you a scenario, and I want you to tell me what you would pass you if they came to ask you this question. So I'm asking you for an intuitive response to this question. The doctor says, I have to prescribe in this very dangerous case, a treatment that will last eight days. It's gotta be consecutive for eight days. Otherwise, the life of this patient is in jeopardy. He may lose his life unless you have eight consecutive days 
of treatment. Okay. Now, let me add another element into the equation, into the scenario. The case is where we start on Shabbos, the treatment, and that will be day one. What does that mean in terms of an eight-day treatment? If we start on day one, which is Shabbos, how many Shabbosos will we violate? Two, we have no choice. Because if day number one of the treatment is on Shabbos, and that's when the, you know, the doctor, let's say, came out of the examining room or he got the results of a test, and he says, let's begin an eight-day treatment, then we will have to, by definition, we have no choice, but violate two Shabbos today, count another seven treatment days of treatment, you reach the next Shabbos. So the eighth day of treatment will be the second Shabbos, and you violated two Shabbos consecutively. Now you're ready for my question, if, you, if you're with me until now. Supposing we can start the first treatment at 6 p.m. on Shabbos evening. Let's say, for argument's sake, it's Shabbos is out at 5. And therefore, the first day of treatment, which is Saturday, is not Shabbos. Do you follow my point? You can call it Saturday, you can call it Sunday. That's irrelevant. It's the first day of treatment. But would I begin the treatment on Shabbos? Or would it make more sense to postpone the first treatment? It'll be on that day, but it'll be after we make Abdullah, if you follow me. So I'm going to take a little vote over here, so to speak. I'm going to give you option A and option B. And if you don't mind, again, if, if I'm insulting anyone, then please tell me. But I'm treating you like I treat my students. Raise your hand if you agree that the halacha should rule in favor of option A. <clears throat> and your other choice is to raise, I didn't give you the options yet. And the other choice is to raise your hand if you approve of option B. So what are the two options? Option A, we've let the two options sink in and then we'll vote. Okay, so don't raise your hand yet. Option A, listen carefully, is delay the first treatment until after Shabbos. After the first treatment, we will count eight consecutive days and we will violate only one Shabbos. That's option A. We'll call option A the delay option. Wait till after Shabbos for the first treatment. Option B is that no, we begin the first treatment on Shabbos, that becomes day one of the eight days, and we will violate not one Shabbos, but two Shabbos. That's option B. So again, option A is the delay option. Option B is the immediate treatment option. Option A requires the violation of one Shabbos. Option B of two Shabbos. So we don't have enough information. What information do I need out? I thought I got no. Does it make a difference? And it's a medical decision. As far as, as, far as we know, there's no medical difference. I mean, again, the doctor says today has to be day one. In his mind, there's no difference between this minute, that minute. It's got to be today is day one. You got to start the treatment today and consecutive treatments from day one, another seven days till day eight. Option A says delay until after Shabbos. Option B says violate two Shabbos, begin the treatment immediately. All in favor of option A, that's the delay option, please raise a hand. I don't care whether it's a right hand or a left hand. Okay? It looks like we have a majority, but let's go to option B. All in favor of option B. Okay, it's a close tie. Like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
how do you say cast the deciding ballot? Is that it? I'm in favor of option A, and I'll tell you why. It doesn't make any sense to violate two Shabbosos when I can violate one Shabbos. What's the rush? If you can delay the first treatment till after Shabbos, why don't you do so? Again, we're assuming now that all the factors are equal. I mean, and I'll tell you why. No, let me explain to you why I have a right to make that assumption. The Shulchan Aruch codifies this case in Hilcha Shabbos. And he doesn't make any ifs, ands, or buts, meaning there are no qualifications, no fine print. You know, sometimes you, know, you have a contract or a legal document there's a fine print. Here, there's no fine print. Now, in order to appreciate the Pesach of the Shulchan Aruch, you know, this is the part of my discussion where I, I get very textual, which for some people is good. For other people, maybe it's more challenging. But I'll try to explain everything in the text. If you're on page one, which it doesn't say page one on it, it'll say on the top right, Reish Ayin Vav, but it's the last three lines on the, on the, at the end of the page, meaning at the bottom of the, of the left column. So again, three lines up from the bottom of the left column. And this is a quote from a Gemara in Masech the Yom. And you're going to see that the Ramam codifies this Gemara Lahalach. So it's not that we're learning, you know, sometimes you learn it in Gemara, and the Gemara raises a theoretical possibility. My logic would have compelled me, Li Akev, delay Adli Urta, wait until nightfall. He Hechia, what do we gain by delaying in the violation of Chavez the first treatment until nightfall? Delo nechel, we wouldn't machala, we to desecrate. Ale, for the sake of this chole, tre shabosos, two shabosos, that's the mal de tema, which I voted in favor of option A, so at least I'm okay with the mal de tema. But you should know that whenever it says those words in Aramaic mal de tema, it means we're going to reject that. A mashmalon, that's the kuf bem lavin, that we don't say this. But rather, we're going to violate two Shabbosos. So those who voted in favor of option B, you can pat yourself on the shoulder because, as we say in Gemara language, you were machaving to the Gemara. So you came up with the Gemara's conclusion. The Gemara thought logically in the Mao de Tema, why should we violate two Shabbosos? One is enough. And the Maskana, the final conclusion of the Gemara, Kamashmala, that we will violate two Shabbosos. And the Ramam codifies this, which is in the same paragraph on the same page, but a little bit earlier in the page. And the Ram writes, Omdu Bioma Shabbos. Umdu means that they called in the physician to give a you know, to give a uh, recommendation. And it was on Shabbos, right? So it happens to be on Shabbos. He comes out of the, you know, the office and he says, he needs the, fi the following treatment. Shmona Yom for eight days. Says the Rabbi, Ein Omrim, don't say like the Baal de Teva that we saw in the Gemara. At Namtin, we should wait. Ad Erev, delay it until after Shabbos. Kadesh Allah, Lechal Olav, Shtei Shabbosos. Ela Maschilim Mehayom, we begin from today, Shu Shabbos. The Ramah now formulates a general principle in Aloha. The status of Shabbos with regard to a, a 
an ill person who is in a jeopardizing his life sentence. Anything that could help him, it's chol. So you're not violating two Shabbosos because when it comes to a chole, forget about calculating how many different Shabbosos you violate. I don't even care if there are a hundred Shabbos. So it's a chola, and Shabbos is chola. You know, I'm reminded of a story when my wife was pregnant with our first, that goes back a while. I, it was right before Yom Kippur. I asked Rav Salavechi if she should fast on Yom Kippur. I knew the answer. For sure she should fast on Yom Kippur. And then I said to her, Salvage, and again, I knew the answer, but I decided to ask anyway. I was a little bit of a rascal. I asked him, and what happens if she needs to eat? And then he starts giving me a whole list of symptoms. <laughs> and he says, she should eat on Yom Kippur. So then I asked him, again, I knew the answer. <laughs> Should I give her small portions? You know, they have a, a whole thing. You know, you give less than this every nine seconds, blah, blah, blah. You know, every nine minutes, I mean. So he looks at me. And immediately, with a, almost an anger in his voice, he says to him, no, she should eat kisudas shlomo amelech v'shaito. <laughs> Let her eat a full banquet meal. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that, but... I wanted to hear it from you, you know, <laughs> so I could tell it over to you. So that's called in the Rambam's language, Shabbos Kechol Eitzel Chol Yeah. I had two incidents. A friend of mine came to me a half an hour before Shabbat, and he thinks he needs to see a car. Her son had been in an accident, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the middle of the night, and she was in the second time I was in the house, the lady started getting heart palpitations. So I said to her, let's go next door. You're not a Jewish neighbor who drive to the hospital. They said to me, I should have and I could have driven her to the hospital. For the right. Same reason. So I was thinking breaking my own kippah too, because I was going to help my wife. No, no, no. Just kidding. <laughs> it wouldn't have helped her at all. <laughs> No, no, the Shulchan Aruch Paskin's B, but he has no, I don't know your name, so I apologize, but. Yeah. Sivi? So I'm saying, Sivi would say that the Shulchan Aruch is telling me to violate two Shabbosos because maybe it would help him if we immediately, isn't, wasn't that your logic? Not at all. And my husband was also a Talmud of the Rubs, yeah. and, uh, and I know the thinking, and I, as a nurse, I have been, had so many instances where people didn't go to the hospital on Shabbat, one lost a baby, a, a child was permanently injured because they were going to wait until after Shabbat. So again, I, I'm going to repeat so what I said, maybe you didn't hear me. No. What I said was that you could have added the following clause to the Shulchan Aruch, and that is, don't take chances. Don't delay the treatment. You never know what could happen. That's what I'm saying. That's, what I'm, that's why I quoted you. I'm quoting you, and you're saying I didn't say it. This is what Sivya is saying, that maybe the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, that we should violate two Chabasas. And that's option A, without delaying, or well, option B, I guess it was, right? I forgot, I forgot my B. Because maybe the person will die if you wait a few hours. So what I'm telling you is that that's not so. How do I know it's not so? Because the Shulchan Aruch is talking about whether or not Shabbos is whole. He doesn't mention a word about getting the doctors okay waiting a few hours. He implies that even if the doctor would be okay and he would allow you to delay the treatment until after Shabbos, nevertheless, we will violate the Shabbos. And in this particular essay from Rav Salvechik, which is authored by Rav Michal Shurkin in a book called Harry Kedem, he quotes the Rav as that we don't 
need to raise the question, well, are we taking an extra element of danger and risk if we delay it till after Shabbos? This is an absolute unqualified rule that we will violate both Shabbos. Even if the doctor will tell you that there's no loss or damage or risk factor in delaying it. Do you hear this, my friends? This is mind-boggling. If I would have told you this before I came in here, and Rabbi Shur invited me to give the shir, you would tell me, Burzon, go home. Don't, don't give me this crazy business. This is ridiculous. To violate two shot muscles, but you could only violate one? What are you, nuts? And you'd be right for saying me for saying this to me. And the reason I wanted to discuss this with you today is because this is such a revolution, it really changes our whole concept of what it means when we say violate the Shabbos for the sake of a cholah. It adds a whole new element and a new perspective on this very, very basic halach a principle which applies, you know, during COVID, I know there's so many chuvas about, you know, are you allowed to take this kind of test, you know, for COVID on Shabbos and, you know, do you have to get a guy to do it? And then there are childless about uh, even the vaccine. Did you believe this? Then there's serious childless. Again, I'm not, maybe, you know, if I come back again, if you'll fight back again, we could discuss this. But perhaps to violate the Shabbos for a, for a vaccine. I, mean, I don't know about the third one, I'm not sure, the booster, but at least the tubers were written, you know, back then for the first two vaccines. So this concept of overriding the Shabbos for a chola is not something theoretical. It's not something that, you know, once in a million years, this could happen. And the Rambam, based on the Gemara, is addressing a scenario in which no loss at delaying the violation of Shabbos. But no, he's a Cholish Yishbal Sakana. We will classify him as such, and then we'll apply the rule that Shabbos he kechol, it's a Cholish Yishbal Sakana. It's Chol. You know, it reminds me, last night I gave a lecture in Modiyin on Rabbi Yisrael Salanta. You heard of him? He was the founder of, who knows, which movement? The Musa movement. You know, when the cholera epidemic broke out in Lithuania, people were dying like flies. And on Leil Yom Kippur, Rabbi Yisrael went from shul to shul, making kiddush on Leil Kolmidri night, telling that every Jew has to break his fast. So I would have come to Rabbi Yisrael and I said, wait a minute. I got this Jew over here, Baruch Hashem. He's very healthy. He's got, you know, he's got, uh, what do they call it? The Nogdanim uh, in English, what are they call it? He's got antibodies, you know, whatever. And Rabbi Sol would have thrown me out of there. He says, look, we are all considered in this definition of colon. And just like Rabbi Sol she yelled at me and said, she should eat. You know, as soon as I'm out for shite, though, there's no Yom Kippur, he said. I remember that. There's no Yom Kippur. And Baruch Hashem, my wife uh, gave birth a few days later, but she didn't have to violate Yom Kippur. Yes, please. I, I'm just trying to figure out how, what time do we finish? At 11? Okay. I don't know if I'll go all the way to a quarter past, but uh, I just want to fit in whatever I can in the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes. What, what happened? Yeah. Okay, great. Michael. Because he's a chola. And now we're going to try to analyze this. Okay, so the question was, if there are no medical risks to the best of our knowledge, based on the physician's evaluation in delaying the treatment, treatment number one, for a few hours to after Shabbos, why violate the Shabbos? And instead of desecrating one Shabbos, two Shabbos. 
what is the halachic ruling or principle that could give us some sort of an insight to what I said, that if I had said this before I was invited to give a shit, you would have thrown me out, and rightfully so. Let's start from the basics. Do we violate the Shabbos for Pikuach Nefesh? And if so, what's the source for that? What should be your immediate response to my question? Two, two words in the Torah. Which two words? That's all. The Ramam is very strange. That's the first paragraph on page one of the the Ramam says that we have a principle called Dechui Yitzel Shabbos Yitzel Sakonis Nefoshis. Now here, I would like to make you sensitive, if I can, to the question that we're going to raise, which is why the Ramam rises. To give you a little bit of methodology, which you've all heard of brisk, the brisk of I don't know if anyone here has any children, grandchildren who learned at brisk. In the brisk of there's no such thing as an extra word in the realm. And if you deny that, then you've denied one of the principles, the tenets of the faith, so to speak, the tenets of the brisker methodology. Ain't no such thing. If the Raman writes something, he's compelled to write it. He has to tell you a chidosh. Why does the Raman have to tell me? The chuya he hashavos etzel pikuach nefesh. We have a principle which the Raman has codified all over the show that for the sake of the we violate the Torah. Apparently, if you're following the methodology, the Raman had a thought which we should appreciate that maybe Shabbos would be an exception to the rule. And in the case of Shabbos, because of the great holiness of Shabbos, we would not violate the Shabbos even at the expense of losing an image. And the Ramam had to write that this is not so, that we have a new principle called HaShabbos Tuchuyahi Eitzel Ikuach. Why? In order to understand this Ramam that we just said, that Shabbos is Dechuyah, we have to fast forward 29 chapters into the Ramam. And in Perik Laman, the Ramam writes, HaShabbos, this is line five, line six, HaShabbos v'yavodah zorah kol achas mehen mishteyen shkula keneged shar kol mitzvah satorah. There are two Mitzvot in the Torah, one's a losos and one's an essay, which are as weighty as the entire Torah. Put the entire Torah, 612 on one side of the scale, and Avodah Zorah on the other. They're all equal. Put 612 on one side and Shabbos on the other side, says the Ramam, they're all equal. The Ramam has upgraded Shabbos to the status of what? Of Avodah Zorah. And therefore the Ramam says, a person who deliberately violates any Isa in the Torah will call him a Russian, but he's still a Jew. This is why I don't know if you remember from at least in my youth. You know, you went to a bakery. Is this, it, can somebody tell me, is this true till today? That you go to a bakery and it says on the outside, Shomer Shabbos. Right? Says the Rambam, a person who violates the Shabbos, and Chas V'sholom, he keeps his store open on Shabbos. He's like someone who worshipped an idol, Uchneim, both a, an idolater, and a public desecrator of the Shabbos, again, don't ask me questions about contemporary life. That's another shi'a, if you'll invite me back, called Tinok Shanishba. But I'm talking about someone who knows 
He was taught, was raised, and he violates the Shabbos, desecrates it publicly. The Ramam says he's a god. What does that mean he's a god? He's not a god, but he's like a god. We don't trust him. We don't rely on his shechit if he slaughters an animal. We don't rely on his testimony in Kashrus. We can't allow him to sign a get as a witness. He's not part of a minion. And the Rambam equates the Shabbos violator with the idolater who violates our voters. This is a Jew whom you would not violate Shabbos? No, no, I didn't say that. What I said was that the Rambam has upgraded the severity of Shabbos and he equalized it with the severity of Avodah Zarah. And his school of Kinegan called Mitzvahs and Arayu Kigai, whatever that means, we don't trust them and so forth and so on. Now, let's go back to the first Rambam and now answer the following question. Why did the Rambam feel compelled to tell me, to notify me, that we violate Shabbos for the sake of Pikuach Nefesh? Why would I think otherwise? Why wouldn't I have applied on my own logic the universal principle of a Kaiman. Why does the Rambam have to tell me, you know what? That Shabbos, even in the case of Shabbos, you'll override the Shabbos. Why do I need that? I have a Kaiman. And what's the answer? Next. Because since Avodah Zorah is one of the cardinal sins for called Nafshecha, that you have to give up your life rather than violate. And, and, uh, and worship an idol. And the Rambam now has equated Shabbos with Avodah Zorah. And a desecrator of Shabbos is like an Obed Avodah Zorah. Because it's the Os, Beinu, Beinenu. I would have thought that just like Avodah Zorah does not override Bechayim, you can't override Avodah Zorah for the sake of Bechayim, I wouldn't override the Shabbos for the sake of Bechayim. Because Shabbos equals Avodah Zorah. Mashmalan, and now the Rama tells me what is really a, a, a new chiddush, a, a you know, a break, a breakthrough. And the Rama says, "No, as great as Shabbos is, Shabbos dechuya he eats el pikuach. Don't make a mistake. Don't fall into the trap." of equating Shabbos with our vote Zorah as far as the Chai Bohem, no. We will override and desecrate the Shabbos. And now the question is why? We've made such a good argument from the language of the Rambam. We're not quoting any extraneous sources. The Rambam himself equates desecration of Shabbos with our vote Zorah. Why don't we apply the principle that applies to our vote Zorah to Shabbos and never let this man die rather than violate the Shabbos, because we will not desecrate Avodah Zorah, violate Avodah Zorah for the sake of the Chai Bohem of saving the life. And the Rambam has now equated in Paraklam and Milton Shabbos, Shabbos violation with Avodah Zorah. And here Rav Salvechi comes up with a revolution. We will not violate the Shabbos for the sake of saving a person's life. Because Shabbos equals Avodah Zorah. But, it's always a but. The Gemara says, listen carefully, you'll see it in the paragraph on the bottom right, Chalel olav Shabbos achas bishvil she yishmar Shabbosos harve. The Gemara has a pasuk in Chumash, the Pasuk says, Vishamru es HaShabbos, that the observance of Shabbos is what creates the Shabbos. And therefore, we will violate the Shabbos for the sake of Pikuach Nefesh, because this Jew will observe many Shabbos. So what's on the scale is one Shabbos versus many Shabbos. And the plurality, the, the majority of Shabbos will override, will tip the scale against one single Shabbos. Or for that matter, two Shabbos. Or 20 Shabbos. The number is irrelevant. And why? 
because the Torah says, Vishamru Bene Yisrael Sashabas. Our goal is the observance of Shabbos. And even though we're going to violate this Shabbos, and maybe even next, but at the end of the day, the benefits outweigh the negative points, and we're going to have many Shabbos that we are. And that's the key of a mitzvah, Visham Bene Yisrael Sashabas. So our salvation claims that Bechai Bahem would not be sufficient to allow us to desecrate the Shabbos. We need a new principle, which is formulated by the Gemara and derived from its own source of the Shamru B'nai Yisrael. And what that means is that when we desecrate the Shabbos, we are not being Mechal Shabbos for the sake of the Chol, but rather we're being Mechai the Shabbos. We're fulfilling the mitzvah of Shabbos. Because the mitzvah of Shabbos is Vishamru. I'm saving the life of the coin. I don't know. That's a different question. I, I, I didn't prepare that, so don't embarrass me if you don't mind. I, I'm just trying to develop a thesis here that will help us perhaps get an insight into why we might violate two Shabbosos rather than delay until after Shabbos. This is this is such a revolution. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're following how revolutionary this is. We're not saying that Shabbos fits into the normal bag of 600 mitzvahs and apply the chaybin. We can't apply the chaybin because Shabbos violation is like Avodah Zorah. And if in Avodah Zorah we don't violate, then in Shabbos we don't violate. But the Gemara derives from a special mitzvah of the Shabru that this is the way that we observe Shabbos. Do you hear the paradox? Violating the Shabbos is itself a cure of Shabbos. We are fulfilling the Shabbos by violating the Shabbos. When I read this, I reminded myself, there's a famous Yushalmi that tells a story about one Amora, he lost one one of his close relatives. And when the procession passed by the, the deceased, he was a coin and he refused to go near the deceased. They pushed him. Now, you know that a coin is not allowed to be metami tumus mess. Is that clear? I mean, I don't have to explain that. He cannot contract tumor. But for the seven, for the seven close relatives, now, how do you understand that? He's allowed to override his violation of Tuma for the sake of Avelus, for the sake of participating in the dead. No, it's not that way. The Yushalmi's not saying he's allowed to. Ah, we'll give him special kind of dispensation and, and license to be metallic himself. No, we're going to push him so that he has contact with the dead. You know what that means, my friends? That his mitzvah of covet ames, of Avelus, is to desecrate his just kahuna. That's the way he expresses his mourning and his grief, according to Torah law, by desecrating his Kedushas kahuna and actively being metami himself to the mess. That's his mitzvah. It's a violation of desecrating Kedushas kahuna, which is now upgraded and converted into a mitzvah. Do you follow me? It's, it's, it's a mind-boggling concept. And although Rav Salvation doesn't make that analogy, I think it's a fair analogy. Rav Salvation is now telling us that when we violate the Shabbos for the sake of a chola, we are in effect being Makai of the Shabbos. It's a kiyum of Shabbos. Under the law of the Shabu B'nai Yisrael, so Shabbos, Chalel, all of Shabbos, Achas, B'chdei, Sheyishmar, Shabbos, Ashar. And now, for those who like to follow the text, we turn to page two, which is Reishai and Zion on the top. And we're up to the paragraph that starts, Achim.
And again, I'm going to spare you of, you know, the tedious, you know, work of reading every line and every word in the text. I'm going to sort of highlight part of the text. And he says the following. Second paragraph. Second paragraph, yeah. It says, Achen. I mean, again, you might call it the first paragraph, but I call it the second. As long as you find the word Achen, you'll know where I'm up to. He presents the following thesis. With regard to this cholera, we're going to have to violate the Shabbos. There's no way out because we need eight days of treatment. And whenever you start that treatment, one Shabbos will be included. So then we define this cholera and categorize him as someone whose life-threatening situation overrides the Shabbos. We know for sure that the mitzvah of Vishabru will apply to this kola. That in order to fulfill Vishabru, we have to violate the Shabbos. The violation of the Shabbos is itself a key of a fulfillment of the Shabbos. The Shabbos and the Shabbos. Once having said so, it no longer matters whether we violate one Shabbos or two Shabbos. Because both Shabbos now come under Bisham. And then we go to the paragraph in Nira on the bottom right. And here's where our salvation adds a whole new dimension for everything that we've been saying. If you're going to have to do malacha and violate the Shabbos for the sake of because nefesh of the chola, then he says it doesn't matter how many malachas you're going to violate. And not only that, it doesn't matter how many malachas you'll violate on how many different Shabbos. What's the proof for such a radical conclusion? Why don't I minimize the malachas? So on the top left of this same page, he quotes a rush. The rush in turn quotes a rife. But the names are not important for me right now. I just want to get the concept. The case was, it was a chole, and we had to feed him meat to make him survive. That those were the, you know, the uh, reality of the, of the scenario. We have two options. We can slaughter an animal or we can feed him nevelus and trephus, non-kosher meat. And once again, I could go through the voting here with you know, scenario A, scenario B, but we don't have time for that. But who can defend the position that we should feed him nevela, non-kosher meat, rather than shecht an animal? Anybody willing to defend that position? Which was apparently the accepted view before the rush quoted the Raven? No, no, no. Why would you rather feed him nevela than shecht an animal, a kosher animal? Exactly. The chumas avera. An avela, as bad as it is, non-kosher meat, it's only a violation of a lot, a lotas. But shechting on Shabbos is a violation of a malacha, which is a cardinal, which is a capital sin. You get skila for that. So the logic, compelling logic, would, would dictate that we should minimize the chil Shabbos by feeding him the vela, no chil Shabbos at all, Rather than shechting an animal and, and violating the shops, the rush says no. We're going to shech the animal. You know why? Because after we shech the animal, what are we going to do with the meat? 
I know today maybe it's different. I don't know. If, is there such a thing as sushi meat? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, what do you have to do with meat after you check the animal? You have to cook it. Cooking is one of the Lama Tesvalos. Says the rush. No matter how you slice the cake, you're going to have to violate the Shabbos. And if you give him the Vela, you'll have to take the Vela and cook the Vela. So once you're violating the Shabbos, it makes no difference whether you violate the Shabbos and the Bishul alone or add to boot a violation of the Shabbos and the Shechita. Says of Salvation, you see something unbelievable here. That once we have a Chol HaShiyesh Bal Sakana, and that means we're going to have to violate the Shabbos, then the Shabbos, the Shabbos kicks in. And our observance of the Shabbos is by violating the Shabbos. And therefore, what difference does it make whether you violate the Shabbos with Bichol or you add Shrit and Kabut? So you violate two Malachs. And Rav Soloveitchik says that it doesn't matter if these Malachs are on one Shabbos or on many different Shabbos. It's the same principle applies. Once you have a Chola, we don't count how many Malachs you're going to violate. Once you have the chola, then the Shabbos itself is given to violation, to desecration because of the mitzvah of the Shabbos of the Shabbos. Once the mitzvah of the Shabbos of the Shabbos kicks in, it doesn't matter how many malachas you're going to violate. It doesn't matter how many Shabbos you're going to violate because you already have the mitzvah of the Shabbos. And he proves that many Shabbosos are called the same Shabbos. What does that mean? The Mechaz Chinuch, and with this we'll conclude for today, says, you know, every Malach has a shear, a minimum amount, less than which doesn't qualify as a violation of the Shabbos. So let's say he did half a shear of Malach on one Shabbos, and on the following Shabbos, he did the other half of the shear of the same Malach. And the Mechaz Chinuch says in such a case, he violates the Shabbos because we're mitzari if we integrate the two Shabbos together. And that means that all Shabbos are really one continuous entity. And that was going to be the philosophical part of my discussion, but we don't have time for that. So maybe if, you, if you'll invite me back another time, I'll come. You have to check that out with Rabbi Shur. Anyway, it's been a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I want you to think over what we said. I pointed out certain paragraphs. Take this with you, if you don't mind. And if we get a chance, we'll try to finish this up on another occasion. <laughs> I would say the following. You know, if I could use the term loosely, I mean, don't take me literally, is something called a migraine headache. What do I mean in this context? I don't mean literally a migraine headache. I'm using it as a, a pedagogical tool. Someone with a migraine headache never has to freeze his life or her life. I mean, it's really, the, you know, you're in terrible straits. If you have a headache that will require you to get into bed, I mean, you just can't function, then rely on me, you can take an aspirin. Because that gives you the status of a cold. But again, that, you know, I was hoping you'd ask me some questions on the cheer. I mean... I don't think a headache is sakana, but again, if you, you know, you have a headache that could be, I don't know what, you know, I don't want to say words here that get me too scared to say those words, but, you know, I, anyone who told you not to take an aspirin on Shabbos is talking about a case where you're not a cholish yesh post sakana. Our shit today was about a cholish yesh post sakana. Okay, then.